The following program was recorded earlier this evening. And now, Heidi Tong, Jack Cafferty, Jerry Gerard with sports, and Bob Harris with the weather. The Emmy Award-winning Channel 11 News at 10. Good evening. The countdown is on now to Bill Clinton's inauguration. It's down to just a few hours. In less than 14 hours, in fact, Bill Clinton will be sworn in as President of the United States, claiming the mantle of leadership for himself and for a whole generation. This morning, the reflection as the president-elect takes a personal moment at the grave of John F. Kennedy. And tonight, the celebration. And pray that you really feel fine. And we'll have more on the inaugural Eve celebrations in just a few moments. Meanwhile, in the Persian Gulf showdown, Saddam Hussein has declared a unilateral ceasefire to go into effect at midnight tonight. The Iraqi leader calls it a goodwill gesture to the incoming Clinton administration. The president-elect is reportedly skeptical. Meanwhile, the UN is considering peacekeepers for the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border. And the Vatican says it will speak for Iraq in the U.N. General Assembly. Meanwhile, there were more Allied bombing raids in the no-fly zones. Earlier in the day today, Allied jets bombed radar sites in Iraq. Baghdad claims that 43 people were killed. A breakthrough of sorts tonight in the nasty custody dispute between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow. The former lovers seem to have come to an agreement on some of the issues concerning two of their children. Stephanie Shelton has a tales for us. Woody Allen and Mia Farrow spent much of their day here at Yale New Haven Hospital, where child abuse experts have been talking to their seven-year-old adopted daughter, Dylan, trying to determine if, as Farrow charges, she was sexually abused by Allen. That's where they were when Allen's lawyer released details of an agreement giving Allen at least some of what he has been demanding in court, two-day-a-week supervised visits with five-year-old Satchel and the resumption of therapy for Dylan. At least we made some headway and uh, to go through a full hearing on both sides just on these two issues alone uh, would be very time consuming, very costly, and I think very emotionally debilitating uh, for both parties. Mia Farrow withdrew Dylan from therapy last August and Allen's visits with his son were ended around Thanksgiving. Renewal of these were the meat of a court hearing schedule for January 26th. Sladka says everything yeah. else is now on hold. Uh, he still has no contact with his daughter. And uh, uh, he agreed in the interest, I guess, of both children that he would forego on a temporary basis seeing Dylan until she re-enters therapy and be guided by what the therapist says. But Alan has not given up the relationship that thrust this bitter custody fight into the spotlight. Sladka says his client is still seeing 21-year-old Sunyi Previn, Pharaoh's adopted daughter. That has nothing to do with... Uh, his rights to see his other children. Allen's lawyer says as soon as the Connecticut child abuse charges are resolved, and he expects them to be resolved favorably, Allen will then push for custody of all three of his children. Stephanie Shelton, Channel 11 News at 10. Tonight we get a chilling first-hand look at the ordeal Katie Beers went through during her 16 days of captivity. Laurel Fairworth has a detailed account of Casey's tragic experience in the child's own words. It's hard not to cry hearing the story, Katie Beer's bizarre abduction and 16-day imprisonment told in her own words. A transcript of the statement Katie made to police was leaked to the Associated Press. In it, the 10-year-old describes her ordeal in chilling detail. She says it started out as fun. The man she calls Uncle John bought her a doll and then took her to his house to play a video game. But then Katie says, quote, he started kissing me. He started unrolling the rugs, and then I was in like a cave. I was in a tunnel. John was pulling me through. He said he was going to kidnap me. Inside the dungeon, accused captor John Esposito made the youngster tape a fake message saying a man had kidnapped her and that he had a knife. Katie tried to record a real message to save herself. She told police, quote, John went upstairs for something, so I made another tape telling Aunt Linda Big John had me. When Esposito heard what she had done, he made her re-record the message, and she says, quote, I was crying because I wanted to go home. But that was not to be. Beginning two days after her abduction, Katie says, quote, he would handcuff me and had a chain around my neck. He did this because I was banging on the ceiling. I saw on the TV that the police were at the house. He had a camera that showed the outside. I was banging, but they didn't hear me. 
And then, quote, John came down once a day with food. I asked him to come down twice a day, but he said, no, the police are on my case. Katie also told authorities that Esposito touched her in a sexual manner several times during her captivity. A grand jury has since handed up an indictment against John Esposito. Katie is now with a foster family, and she was enrolled in school today. Still to come, a custody battle between her mother and the county. Laurel Fair with Channel 11, News at 10. And today, a formal indictment for John Esposito. While back at Esposito's home, police keep digging for clues. And as Long Island correspondent Drew Scott tells us, they question whether Esposito built that dungeon all by himself. Cops dug up what remains of John Esposito's underground hiding place for Katie Beers, drained his swimming pool, and removed his elaborate subterranean tunnel. The 43-year-old building contractor appeared in court and was told for the first time formally he was indicted by a grand jury in the bizarre kidnapping case. As to John Esposito, a case has pre been presented under docket number 844 of 93. The grand jury returned a true bill under indictment number 150 of 93. I'm handing the cert up to the court, asking for two days for the hand up. Esposito says his attorney is being kept separate from the rest of the prison population in Suffolk County. Inmates, however, have reportedly heckled him during the one hour a day. He is free to exercise and bathe, more freedom than he granted 10-year-old Katie Beers during her 16 days of captivity. What is the mental frame uh, mind of your client at this you moment? This well, I spoke with him this morning, and he, uh, he appears to, to be uh, going through a great deal of mental anguish. He is, he's tired. He looks like he's lost some weight. Uh, he uh, having a very difficult time. He looks lonely. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he's suffering. Police say it's conceivable Esposito got help to pour the concrete for his backyard tomb a year and a half ago. But they are sure, and experts like Hofstra University criminologist John Wildeman agree, only Esposito knew what diabolical purpose the secret crypt would serve. As far as his specific motivations and so forth, building the shelter and, and, and that sort of thing. I guess secrecy, uh, the erotic gratification of secrecy and, and having this person at your mercy. Police say that they will search several more days on the Esposito property to see if there's any evidence that other children may have been here. In the meantime, Esposito is being held at the Suffolk County Jail in Riverhead on a half million dollars bail. From Long Island, Drew Scott, Channel 11, News at 10. In other news, the stars were shining bright tonight for Bill Clinton on the eve of his inauguration as this country's 42nd president. A stellar group of entertainers saluted the president at a star-studded gala. The show featured Bill Cosby, Barbara Streisand, Elton John, Aretha Franklin, Chuck Berry, among others. It was quite a deal. I think I watching it was quarter to eight. You know, Bill's gonna get this country straight. <laughs> Another big draw for crowds paying from $100 a $1,000 a ticket was Fleetwood Mac performing together for the first time in 13 years, playing the Clinton campaign theme song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Before tonight's big party, a frantic day of final pre-inaugural events for Clinton, spending time with everyone from the nation's governors to Kermit the Frog. John Abishan reports on a day that began with somber reflection for the president-elect at the gravesite of one of his heroes. This morning, an extraordinarily pensive, personal moment for Clinton, tribute and meditation at the John F. Kennedy gravesite, remembering the new leadership Kennedy offered that first drew Clinton into politics. Some 20 of the Kennedy family joined him. Perhaps that was still in his mind as he spoke to past and present governors over lunch at the Library of Congress. He told them he desperately wants to make a difference. I did not run for this job just to warm the seat. But this afternoon belonged to children in two Kennedy Center salutes. Children's interests are one of Hillary Clinton's special causes. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Mr. Clinton spent the rest of the afternoon going over, rehearsing his inaugural speech. Others had last minute preparation too. These are the Mosaic Minstrels, youngsters from New York, Sheepshead Bay. I want to welcome you to Washington because you are the best of New York. 
and you're here for all of us. Their congressman spearheaded fundraising to get them here. And while tonight's big Clinton gala featured huge Hollywood stars, these jazz musicians came here from a Los Angeles high school to play for smaller but just as appreciative audiences. And they all, it seems, have hope for what Clinton can do. I want him to change everything that's going on in this world. Racism, killing. Hillary Clinton and jazz. In Washington, John Aubuchon, Channel 11, News at 10. John will be back a bit later in this broadcast when we go back down to Washington for more on the countdown to tomorrow's inauguration, Katie. As we told you at the top of the newscast, Saddam Hussein is declaring a ceasefire, trying to defuse the showdown in the Gulf while Bill Clinton assumes office. Mark Moody is standing by with The View from Washington for us. Mark? Katie, in about 14 hours, Bill Clinton will inherit the Iraq crisis from George Bush. The good news is that Saddam has apparently extended an olive branch to the incoming administration. The bad news is that perhaps only Saddam himself knows for sure if the offer is genuine. Six days of airstrikes, some experts say, have weighed heavily on Saddam, despite the defiant rhetoric. The latest Allied airstrikes coming after U.S. planes flying in northern Iraq drew anti-aircraft fire. After the Pentagon announced several Iraqi targets had been destroyed, Saddam Hussein and his Revolutionary Command Council offered the Clinton administration a deal. The Revolutionary Command Council has decided to stop shooting. Beginning inauguration morning, Iraq said it would stop shooting, calling its offer a unilateral ceasefire and a goodwill gesture to Bill Clinton. The hope that Baghdad carries that we could establish a new kind of relations based on dialogue and not on military force. Are you confident, uh, what do you think the reaction or response will be? We hope to get positive reaction. But through his spokesman, Bill Clinton appeared to give the so-called peace offer a cold shoulder. Communications Director Stephanopoulos said the incoming administration wanted to see action, not just words. Full compliance with UN resolutions. We need full compliance with the resolutions, and until we see that, uh, you shouldn't expect a change in policy. The Clinton administration was in effect saying that it, Saddam is not doing enough, that it wants to see more, Clinton administration wants to see more, particularly the unrestricted access of nuclear weapons inspectors. And on that score, the top weapons inspector at the UN said that the UN would accept Iraq's offer. Kaidi, Jack. All right, Mark, thanks very much. Meanwhile, the Pentagon announced today five Navy ships have been sent in to help the Coast Guard turn back Haitian refugees bound for the United States. Those ships are there to try to discourage Haitians from making a dangerous trip to Florida in small, rickety boats. A policy President-elect Clinton says he will continue. Uh, based on an aerial survey of the Haitian coast and reports from Coast Guard officials so far, there appears to be no immediate flood of refugees leaving the country. As a wave of Bill Clinton's appointees win confirmation, one faces tough questions about her past actions. Attorney General nominee Zoe Baer telling the Senate Judiciary Committee that she deeply regrets hiring illegal aliens as household servants. Baer admits that she and her husband knew they were breaking the law, but claims they just wanted to find a good babysitter for their son. I allowed myself to be more concerned about the difficulty we were having in child care then I was concerned about this situation. Quite honestly, I was acting at that time really more as a mother than as someone who would be sitting here designated to be Attorney General. Baird is still expected to win confirmation joining a group of appointees confirmed today. They are Secretary of State nominee Warren Christopher, Donna Shalala to head Health and Human Services, Richard Riley is Education Secretary, Robert Reich as Labor Secretary, and Mickey Cantor to be Trade Representative. Lots more straight ahead on the news at 10 tonight. We'll have the latest on the search for the person who fired a bullet through the window of Joey Botafuco's auto shop yesterday. He goes by the name of Gas Pipe, and tonight the FBI has nabbed this mob boss they've been looking for for years. Mario Cuomo's budget is out. It's got good news. It's got bad news. It has some surprising news. And we have a very disturbing story tonight. A murder committed in cold blood in front of television cameras. It looks like a movie, but it's all too real. Coming up. He's psychotic, man. Where am I? What funeral home am I at? Como se llama esto? Where am I at? Somebody shot. The ancient order of Hibernians is ordering its members to boycott the St. Patrick's Day parade if a gay group is allowed to march. 
The Irish group claims the Dinkin administration has demonstrated anti-Catholic bigotry and violated their constitutional rights by denying them the parade permit, giving it instead to a new group that will allow the gays in. But a member of the new committee disputes the Hibernians' version of events, saying they willfully gave up the parade permit. But any suggestion that AOH uh, right to run this parade was ripped away from them is just arrant nonsense, and it's not the fact. Hines went on to say that the Hibernians had actually changed their charter to prohibit local chapters from applying for the parade permit. Nassau County police are chasing down several leads in the shooting of Joey Budifuco's auto body shop on Long Island. Police are looking into whether a disgruntled employee or any neighbors may have had anything to do with the shooting, or if there is a link to the Amy Fisher case. Bullet fragments found in the shop are being analyzed right now. A bullet was fired into the auto body shop yesterday, just a day after Joey's father allegedly received a phone call threatening his son's life. In New Jersey, juror misconduct could be hampering the Glen Ridge trial where four young athletes stand accused of sexually abusing a mildly retarded girl. But as New Jersey correspondent Veronica Mitchell tells us, the judge so far is refusing to grant a mistrial. It is beginning to look like a game of musical chairs for the jury at the Glen Ridge trial. First, there are 16 jurors, then 15. Now only 13 remain seated at the trial of four young athletes accused of sexually molesting a mildly retarded girl. Judge Benjamin Cohen dismissed two jurors who were discussing the case outside the courtroom. The judge is refusing to grant a mistrial, although he calls the behavior inappropriate. We just wanted to make certain that the jury was not tainted. And uh, the judge found that they weren't, so hopefully he was correct. The controversy began on Wednesday when Judge Cohen says he got a phone call from one juror complaining about the behavior of another juror outside the courtroom. The caller says a juror number one, Ronald Simpson, frequently conducted prayer sessions in the jury room praying for the alleged victim and her family. Jurors overheard Simpson, a corrections officer at the Essex County Jail, saying, quote, he was sick and tired of women being raped and then having their whole history exposed in court. Judge Cohen says Simpson even boasted that the defendants would, quote, soon be with him, meaning in jail. The jury service of juror number four, Avis Thomas, ended just as abruptly. The judge saying that Thomas told jurors she generally disbelieves the opinions of psychiatrists because of a situation with her own son. Thomas also admits to discussing the case with her pastor against Judge Cohen's orders. I think the judge, what the judge did was very fair. He individually questioned each and every juror, and he made sure that each and every juror that's remaining on this jury panel could be fair and impartial and would consider only the evidence that's presented in the courtroom. The prosecution is expected to conclude its case tomorrow after a brief presentation. After that, the case is going to be turned over to the defense, who are expected to call as their first witness, Paul Archer, the brother of defendant Chris Archer. Archer. In Newark, I'm Veronica Mitchell, Channel 11, News at 10. The camera catches a killing as it happened yesterday in North Lauderdale, Florida. The tape comes from Channel 47, that's an affiliate of Telemundo, which is doing a story on a troubled family. And we warn you beforehand, the scene is quite graphic. The tape was rolling when Emilio Nunez placed flowers on the grave of his daughter. The pregnant 15-year-old died tragically over Thanksgiving, shooting herself in the chest. Just then, Nunez's ex-wife showed up unexpectedly at the cemetery. While the reporter spoke to her, Nunez crept up behind. Nunez apparently pumped 12 9mm rounds into his ex-wife. He reportedly blames her for the daughter's suicide, saying she slapped the girl around after being told of the pregnancy. North Lauderdale police say Nunez is still at large tonight. There was more violence today in Texas. In Dallas, a man shot his wife in the head just moments before a custody hearing in juvenile court. He then turned the gun on himself. Both tonight are in critical condition. A 16-year-old boy was also shot in the leg. Federal investigators are still trying to determine who or what was... Queso is facing 14 murder indictments. Seven allegedly occurred while he was on the run. He's believed to have been controlling the Lucchese crime family since the conviction of Vittorio Amuso, the reputed head of the family, last June. Queso's capture was a coordinated effort of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, starting with information originally supplied by the New York State Organized Crime Task Force and passed on to the Nassau and Brooklyn DAs. 
Anthony Queso made an initial court appearance in federal court in New York this afternoon. He's being held in the Metropolitan Correctional Center where John Gotti spent so much of his time. And sometime this week he will be arraigned here in federal court in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, Stephanie Shelton, Channel 11 News at 10. And just a little later in this show, Geraldo Rivera will take a look at the mob war for control of New York's underworld empire. Jack? Kaidi, Governor Cuomo's new budget has good news for New York City commuters if you assume politicians will keep their word. And that's a bit of a stretch these days sometimes. It has bad news, though, for smokers and other taxpayers. The governor unveiled a proposed $59.1 billion budget in Albany this morning. Highlights include a 21-cent rise in the cigarette tax. That'll give New York the nation's highest cigarette tax. A $130 million cut in the state's school aid fund. $428 million Medicaid cut. And this good news we talked about, a promised freeze on MTA subway and bus fares until 1995. Cuomo also called for scrapping a personal income tax cut, a move he defended and the Republicans blasted. I can't find anything, so I'm not going to pretend that the people can get still another tax cut. We're at the lowest level in 30 years, and I'm very proud of that. But I don't think you can go beyond it right now. He continues to break promises, and uh, every time he uh, he seems, every time he tries to fill his budget gaps, he widens his credibility gap. The state legislature will review Cuomo's budget proposal and is supposed to approve it by April first, April Fool's Day. And at least one of the governor's proposals would surely meet with quick approval by anyone who's ever waited online at the state's Department of Motor Vehicles. Cuomo proposing major changes in the DMV, including allowing drivers to renew their licenses over the phone pay by credit card and those who show up in person apparently would be greeted by an electronic take a number system so you can sit comfortably waiting for your number to come up instead of standing on endless nines you just sit endlessly but at least you're sitting on sort of a 20th century concept though don't you think <laughs> indeed those guys in albany are right with it when the news at 10 continues these firefighting boats cost you the taxpayer seven million dollars neither one of them works at all and they may never work we'll tell you the whole ugly story the woman who survived being trapped in an icy cave with her baby for a week undergoes 11 hours of surgery. We'll have an update on her condition. It's a happy day for some of the U.S. troops in Somalia. They are on their way home tonight. Stay with us. And as promised, we have more for you now on tonight's countdown to tomorrow's big inauguration. We're going to go back to Washington where John Obishon is standing by live for us. John, big night down there tonight. Jack and Kaidi, as we're talking, the Clintons and Gores are on their way to a Baptist church just seven blocks north of here, at which they'll have an inaugural eve prayer service. Then tomorrow morning, another prayer service, this one for the first time for a new president at a historically black church, the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. That congregation served as a station on the Underground Railway for freed slaves. Exactly 12 hours from now, Bill and Hillary Clinton will be having coffee at the White House with George and Barbara Bush, just as the Bushes did with the Reagans, the Reagans with the Carters, a kind of a comforting, intimate ritual that underlines the gentle, orderly way we pass power in the U.S. The ceremony at the Capitol, starting just before noon, includes the only part of the inaugural that's required by the Constitution, the oath of office. Then, of course, the inaugural address, which presidents use to try to set the tone, moral and political, for their term. Roosevelt and John Kennedy did that most successfully, but they all do try to. The parade will start about 2.30. The Clintons escorted at the front, though they might, as Jimmy Carter did, choose to walk to the White House. Gerald Ford spent his last night in the White House before turning power over to Jimmy Carter, whacking away at golf balls on a driving range in the back of the White House. We can be fairly certain, Jack and Kitey, that George Bush is not doing that tonight. We're told he has now made peace with the decision the voters made. All right, All right. thank you for that report, John. In other news, the first American combat troops are on their way home from Somalia after five weeks. The first of 800 Marines from the 9th Regiment, 3rd Battalion, packed their gear and marched out onto the tarmac at Mogadishu Airport. They're now bound for Camp Pendleton, California. Still, almost 25,000 American troops remain in Somalia, most of them riding shotgun on food convoys into the countryside. It's being billed as a possible major shift in policy tonight in Israel. Lawmakers there have abolished a seven-year-old law barring Israelis from meeting with members of the PLO raising hopes that Arabs may agree now to resume the Middle East peace talks. That decision could give a boost to Israel's negotiations with Palestinians and other Arab neighbors. The Palestinians have vowed to boycott the talks until Israel allows the repatriation of those 400-plus Muslim extremists that were expelled into southern Lebanon last month. Until today's vote, Israel had considered the PLO a terrorist group and barred any contacts by any Israelis. 
We have an update tonight on that young mother who was stranded with her infant son in a snow cave while her husband walked 60 miles through a blizzard for help. Nevada doctors had to amputate parts of Jennifer Stolpa's frostbitten feet, about one-third of her left foot and slightly more than a quarter of her right foot. And sadly, a similar operation awaits her husband. The 20-year-old mother is in stable condition tonight after her 11-hour surgery yesterday, and their five-month-old baby up to now will need no surgery. He is in satisfactory condition. It's an absolute miracle they're still alive. That's true. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is back on Earth tonight following a six-day mission in space. Endeavour floated down through a hazy Florida sky and touched down just before 9 o'clock this morning. While in space, the crew of five deployed a satellite, walked in space, and taught a science class to children back on Earth. The crew also is the first to use the new $30 million toilet aboard the shuttle. Certainly a scientific first there. Kind of a dubious distinction, but... Yeah, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's think about that while we uh, talk about what's ahead. Al Sharpton has set his sights on elective office again. We'll tell you which one. We'll also tell you what's being done to convince David Letterman to keep his television show right here in New York City instead of heading out to La La Land. And just in case George Bush had any doubts, this picture should get the message across. Just call it the changing of the guard. 30 million, that's a pay toilet. It seems like Colorado's loss will be New York's gain. Meeting in Washington, the U.S. Conference of Mayors voted to move its annual conference to New York City after canceling plans to hold it in Colorado because of that state's amendment against gay rights laws. Mayor Dinkins, who pushed for the change, talked about the importance of having the conference here in New York City. In Palatine, a week ago Friday. It means that mayors from around the country will be coming to New York, the mayors who are Republican and Democratic, and who we will then go back home and tell folks what a wonderful town we have, as they did. Uh, Dinkins says the June conference will bring as many as a thousand people to the city. Reverend Al Sharpton must have liked his first taste of politics. The reports are he's planning to run for office again. Sources close to Sharpton, who posted a surprisingly strong finish in his run for the Democratic Senate nomination last year, say the activist will be running for city council president. Quoted in the Daily News, the sources say Sharpton plans to announce his candidacy as early as this week, possibly on Saturday. The city struggled to keep its head above water during these tough economic times takes on new meaning with the recent purchase of two high-tech fireboats. It seems the firefighting boats are much more trouble than they're worth, and they're worth plenty. Barry Cunningham has details. It's another case of your tax dollars at work. The city spent nearly $7 million to build these two state-of-the-art fireboats, only to find they flunked their performance tests and sit dead in the water at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The city says the first boat, the John P. Devaney, has a bad seal that allows water to leak in, so it's out of commission. The second boat, the Alfred Ronaldson, has bad valves, so it can't spray its fire hoses and sit idle in the water at the same time. Moreover, the New Orleans manufacturer has no spare parts, and even if it had them, the city wouldn't know what to do with them because the fire department never received a maintenance diagram. It seems very odd that you would build a multi-million dollar piece of machinery and not ensure an adequate supply of spare parts. One would think if you bought a car and you uh, bought a 1993 car and you put a thousand miles on it and something went wrong, there was a malfunction of some sort of part, that you would have a spare part for that uh, piece of apparatus. The fire department designed these smaller, lightweight fireboats out of fiberglass so they can get to a fire quicker than the larger steel-hulled fire vessels that have been part of the harbor skyline for years. Problems arose during trial runs after the vessels sailed up from New Orleans to New York last summer. The city is withholding a final payment of $800,000 and threatening to sue the manufacturer, Textron Marine Services of New Orleans. The company had no comment for now, Meanwhile, the fire department is combing through its contract to find out what went wrong. We can't regulate the water flow through the nozzles. And any firefighting uh, apparatus, if you can't regulate the flow of water that is being delivered, that's a big problem. The department says the boats will float if spare parts can be found. Meanwhile, the fire boats are still under warranty, even if they do appear to be lemons. Barry Cunningham, Channel 11, News at 10. Record losses reported for IBM today. The computer giant lost nearly $5 billion last year, almost $5.5 billion net loss in the fourth quarter alone. Much of that is being blamed on billions of dollars being spent on accounting charges for the 25,000 job cuts that are planned for 1993. 
And the Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester announced it's going to cut its workforce by 2,000 people. Kodak says the layoffs and other cost-cutting measures will save the company more than $200 million this year. On Wall Street, the stock market finished the day mixed. The Dow Jones Industrials lost nearly 19 points, but advancing stocks beat decliners by a margin of 9 to 8. Investors were motivated by corporate earnings reports, including that big quarterly loss reported by IBM. And they also remain cautious about what, if anything, the Clinton administration may do to stimulate the economy. All right, still ahead tonight, Bill Clinton is not the only one looking forward to tomorrow. Convicted killer Jean Harris could find out when she'll be getting out of jail. And will the Giants ever find a new head coach? Another one got away today. Jerry Girard will have that and the rest of tonight's sports. Transit police are reporting subway crime is down again for the 26th consecutive month. The latest figures are for November. The biggest drop came in robberies, down 28.5%. Assaults on subway riders down 20.6%. And arrests on the rails up 6.7%. The final totals for all of last year will be available sometime next month. For the last a couple of days have been giving you sneak peeks at Geraldo Rivera's upcoming primetime special, The New Godfathers. And in tonight's preview, Geraldo Rivera takes a look at who's lining up to replace the jailed Teflon Don, John Gotti. Really sunk John Gotti was the ultimate betrayal. His right-hand man, Sammy the Bull Gravano, turned rat. He squealed on the boss, even as Gotti was preparing to make him heir to the throne. Sammy, once cornered himself by murder charges, gave up his friend to save his own skin. It was the beginning of the end for the American Godfather. Sammy's testimony would help send Gotti away for life. But the FBI tells us that Gotti is still trying to run his criminal empire from behind bars. Just as the 1985 death of Paul Castellano led to the rise of John Gotti, another key murder is likely to signal Gotti's successor. But who will it be? Police sources tell us this man. Pasquale Patsy Conti is one front runner. Conti's lawyers scoff at the FBI charges and tell us Mr. Conti is not a member of organized crime. Not much is known about Conti. We do know that he's a successful Long Island businessman whose family apparently controls some of the key food supermarket chain. The FBI calls this man a sleeper. Sicilian born quiet but deadly. The feds believe he's running one of the biggest crime families in America. John Stanfa is an individual trying to take over as the boss of an entire city and run the organized crime groups in, in Philadelphia. We'd taken some pictures of Stanfa, so I knew what he looked like as I saw him outside his warehouse. Mr. Stanfa? Hi. Geraldo Rivera. How you doing? Can I speak with you a second? Get out of here for my place. Can I speak get with out, you? Get out of here. Can I speak with you just for a minute there? Get out of here for my place. What about this guy? Does this look like a crime boss? His name is Vinny the Chin Gigante, and the feds see him as another possible successor to John Gotti. This is no dapper Don. This exclusive footage shows the Chin acting out what the feds call a clever charade. The feds don't buy it. They say he's crazy like a fox. The New Godfathers airs tomorrow night on Channel 11 at 8 p.m. And following the special on the news at 10, we'll be talking to former U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani on where law enforcement stands and its war against the mob. Jack? Depending on her health, the decision to release convicted killer Jean Harris from prison could come as early as tomorrow. That's when Harris is scheduled to go before the parole board. Her hearing could be held at the Westchester what County Medical Center, where she continues to recover from a blood clot in her leg, a complication from her recent heart bypass surgery. The 69-year-old former girls' school headmistress is listed in good condition there. Harris was granted clemency last month for the 1980 murder of Scarsdale Diet Dr. Herman Tarnauer. She served almost 12 years of a 15-year-to-life sentence. Well, first there was a tug of war between the networks over David Letterman, and now the question is, which city gets him? A published report says Mayor Dinkins' office is making every effort to keep Letterman's hit late-night talk show here because it's a boost to the city's economy. Letterman says he wants to stay in New York when his show moves from NBC to CBS in August, but that he would relocate to Los Angeles under the right conditions, mm. which would be a shame. He should stay in New York. He should Change stay the whole tone of the show, New I think, York. if he went to L.A. We all vote. Okay. Stay Listen to that, Dave. We want you to stay. That's right. Okay? Right. You bet. How about this weather? You want it to stay? Huh? I could pass a little wand over this stuff. and <laughs> Please. Would you please? Get that <laughs> wand out wand. now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's don't. We'll, uh, we'll talk about the weather ahead and uh, specifically what's going to happen in Washington tomorrow weather-wise for all the big events. <laughs> Straight ahead, folks. <laughs>
Welcome back, everybody. Here in Midtown Manhattan, the Empire State Building is dressed up in red, white, and blue lighting tonight. And just in time. But it looks so pretty tonight and tomorrow night, all because of the inauguration. And we're sitting pretty weather-wise, too. Up in the park right now, 28 degrees, a little chilly, but nice and clear. Humidity is 60%. Our dew point is down to 16 degrees. You'd have to chill the air down to 16 to get any kind of condensation going, and we're just not going to do that tonight. The winds are west at 7. The barometer 30.68 and steady. Strong barometric pressure, and skies are perfectly clear. Well, today, a lot of sunshine. Nice day, really. We topped out in the mid-30s here in town after a chilly start at 21 this morning. It was down some single numbers out in the suburbs. The sunrise tomorrow, and we're going to see a lot of sunshine around here, occurs at 716 as the days continue to get longer. Nice, nice weather sign, a nice astronomical sign that we're heading in the right direction. We're also heading the right direction weather-wise. Look, folks, this is a big patch of high pressure with clear weather all over the northeastern part of the country and the Great Lakes region. And what's so good about it is that that high has managed to suppress these clouds down to the south. And they're going to just stay blocked out of the picture for the inauguration tomorrow. And boy, is this going to be a close call. Because by Thursday morning, very nasty weather will be arriving in the D.C. area. But not for tomorrow's parade or the inauguration in the morning or the big balls tomorrow night. No problem at all, weather-wise. These clouds will be moving in overnight tomorrow night and eventually reaching Washington on Thursday and then they'll march up here on Friday and we're probably going to get a little nasty mix by Friday of rain, sleet and snow. You see all that storminess down here. Look at the radar presentation tonight. This is a lot of moisture building up with a storm system out in Texas and Oklahoma. This is a combination of rain, sleet and snow and some heavy pockets of rain over the southeastern part of the country. But as I said, it's being held down to the south by that big area of high pressure. Look at the map for tomorrow morning. There's the high, right on target. It's over North Carolina, and it will just keep everything away from us for about 24 to 36 hours. A lot of sunshine here in the northeast tomorrow. It'll be chilly, a really cold start in the morning, and then get up to about 40, 45 tomorrow afternoon. And then that storm will take its sweet time, inching its way eastward, be here for Friday and for Saturday. That means rainy weather for the most part, and the coastal areas, and then some rain, sleet, and snow inland. Look at the temps tonight. Wide disparity in temperature. From the low 20s here in the city to the single numbers up in the Hudson Valley. Even some spots that will get down close to the zero mark by morning. 36 to 42 for a high tomorrow. A lot of sun. And after the very cold start, it will warm up in the afternoon. We'll take it. 40 degrees. About 45, 46 degrees for the parade in Washington tomorrow. Thursday, increasing cloudiness, a little milder, and then an icy mix on Friday, developing that rain, the sleet, the wet snow, and then plain rain on Saturday. So two stormy days there for Friday and Saturday. Yeah, Let's Jerry go flinging down his pen again in uh, disgust. I don't it's know. It's a testy man. Testy <laughs> man. We're all a little testy today. Okay, thank you, Bob. Still ahead. When it's time to move on, it's time to move on. Just ask George Bush. That's right. <laughs> And uh, Jerry's along with sports next. The Rangers have a new face in the net this season. Yes, a rookie goaltender came up, played in Detroit. We'll have the highlights of that. Islanders as well, and college basketball. Score! It could be a goal by them. Chinov. If not, it's a pair of juice goal. This evening's cultural calendar is brought to you by the card, the American Express card. Don't leave home without it. South Street Seaport Museum puts its maritime collection on display now through May 25th. New York's funniest couple, Stiller and Mira, present an evening of comedy at Queensboro Community College Saturday night. And Long Island Swan Theater presents Hans Christian Andersen's The Snow Queen on Saturdays. This cultural calendar was brought to you by American Express. The debut for Corey Hirsch, young man was goaltending at Binghamton, brought him up to the Rangers, had his big start in Detroit tonight. Kid's good. He had seen tapes of the Rangers, so he took the ice trembling. We understand that. Only gave up two goals, and he finished at 2-2. So not a bad start for this guy. Looks like he's going to be around. Let's take a look at the highlights. Only four goals in the game, so a lot of defense. Second period, one nothing wings. Bork to juice. And his shot goes off Chevelday's glove, trickles in for a goal. Now here's Hirsch in action. Zuboff gives up the puck to Eiserman, one of the real snipers. Now this kid's facing an ace, stops him there, plays it cool, stops him there. Short-handed goal with a score 2-1 wings in the third by Turcotte. This guy is dynamite on the breakaway, goes to his forehand, and look where he places it. Upstairs, 30 saves for Hirsch. The final was 2-2. At the Coliseum, 2-2. What's going on with the 2-2s? 
Sounds like one of those Vietnamese premiers. All right, Bruins and Islanders. A goal here by Fitzgerald on a deflection. Then the third period, 2-1 Bruins face off Green to McInnes, and Curvis lines it up right through the pads, the old five hole to tie it up, and that's the way it ended, two all. In Tampa Bay, Minnesota beat Tampa Bay 4-2 at Ottawa, Quebec, winner 5-2. Toronto over St. Louis 4-0 in the third. In the third, Winnipeg over Chicago. Edmonton leads Los Angeles in the second. Also in the second, Calgary 1-0 over Buffalo. Another rejection for the Giants. They wanted Dave Wanstatt, defensive coordinator for the Cowboys, but so did the Bears. And today he succeeded Mike Ditka. I'm sure that, that some of the fans will wonder if I'm tough enough to, to be in Chicago. I, I can reflect back and, and refresh your memories. I was one of the guys sitting in the meeting room when, when the Cowboys went 1-15. and 15. I was the guy watching the film, and, and I got through that without Maylock. So believe me, I'm, uh, I'm tough enough, and, and I'm uh, looking forward to the challenge. Now, why didn't he pick the Giants? The story is once that is very close friends with Jimmy Johnson. He did not relish the idea of playing Johnson in the same division twice a year, feeling it would be a strain on their friendship. And I can understand that. Hey, you own a clothing store. Your best friend opens a clothing store across the way. How long would you be best friends? About eight minutes, huh? To the first sale? You don't agree? Sorry. By the way, George Young, is, George Young must be really persuasive on the phone. He's talked to two guys, and they both hung up. All right, at the Meadowlands, Providence and Seton Hall tonight, and it went to OT. First half, Providence in control. Haynes, terrific drive. It looked like Seton Hall was a step behind tonight. Haynes with a drive to Kittles underneath. Nice play. Providence by two at the half. Second half, the Hall by two. 25 seconds to go. Miller with a driving hook ties it up and sends it to OT. In the overtime, rebounding. DeHair misses, but here comes the Hall crashing the boards. One rebound by Griffin. Walker puts it up and in. They win it 66 to 61. Meanwhile, number two, Indiana at Lafayette in Purdue. First half, Cheney to Nover, nice play. They went up by 15 points on the fast break here. Graham to Cheney, who's a true first-team All-American, no question. Knight Sun is playing for him, and here, a pass to Cheney for a three-pointer. They're up by 13. Second half, Purdue makes a comeback. Glenn Robinson, a superstar in the making, banks one in, but Indiana had the answers. Graham to Nover, nice passing, beat Purdue 74 to 65. And uh, that's the story in sports. Why am I surprised? Well, there was no racing today. Because it's Tuesday. Oh, that's it for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. Updating our top stories for you now, an indictment was handed up against John Esposito today in the Katie Beers kidnapping case. Meanwhile, Katie's story, in her own words, a transcript of her statement to police revealing her days in captivity. Young Katie said that she was chained by the neck, handcuffed, and touched in a sexual manner several times. Some progress reported in the bitter custody fight between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow tonight. The two agreed out of court to have their seven-year-old adopted daughter, Dylan, continue her therapy sessions and to have Woody Allen resume his twice-weekly visits with their five-year-old son, Satchel. And the stars were out in force tonight on this inauguration eve. Bill Cosby, Aretha Franklin, Fleetwood Mac, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and many others performing at a star-studded gala for President-elect Bill Clinton who, in case you've been living in a cave, will tell you will be sworn in tomorrow as the nation's 42nd president at noon. Okay. And finally tonight, a London museum seems to be jumping the gun on the presidential inauguration. Madame Tussauds Wax Museum showing George the door before his Oval Office chair is even cold. Oh, what a sad picture. Moving the president out and Bill Clinton in. <laughs> <laughs> the changing of the guard occurring this morning, a full 24 hours before the real transition in Washington. But don't feel too sorry for George Bush. After some maintenance, apparently they've been letting him fall into disrepair, but after some maintenance, <laughs> the statue is expected to take a place of honor in the museum's area for, what else, former U.S. <laughs> president. <laughs> and yeah, there he goes. I saw Cheney and Powell take him out of a briefing during the Gulf War like that one day. <laughs> what a picture. Put your hand under his elbow. And That's <laughs> Channel 11 News for this Tuesday. Thanks for being with us. Indeed. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night for the news at 10. Cheers is next. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> WPIX has news bureaus in New Jersey at 223 Montrose Avenue, Rutherford, and on Long Island at the Supreme Court Building, Mineola, and 255 Executive Drive, Plainview. The preceding program was recorded earlier this evening.